Coming up on today's show. And I begged God to, to let me die. I begged, I'm like, look, take me out of this. But he didn't. And what he did was gave me the strength, the courage, the fortitude to go on. Peace be with you. This is Catholic Sports Radio, located at the intersection of your faith life and sports life, and on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and lots and lots of other platforms. I am Bruce Wozniak, talking with Catholic guests who are current or former athletes, coaches, referees, umpires, clergy, administrators, and more from the pro, amateur, and scholastic ranks about the intersection of their faith life and their sports life. The show website is catholicsportsradio.net. Be sure that you have signed up there for free for the weekly Catholic Sports Radio e-newsletter. Look, too, at the top of the website for links to social media, meaning Facebook, Twitter, yeah, 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 X, (laughs) Instagram, and YouTube, so that you can engage with me and the show that way. I have been mentioning it the last few weeks. Hopefully, by now, you have seen the new video that I posted on YouTube on February 11, called How You Can Help Catholic Sports Radio, where I'm talking about a list of different ways to help support my efforts and being just a one-person operation. The Catholic Sports Radio community is the Facebook group consisting of listeners of this show and some past guests. That is free to join, and you can also find a link for that as well on catholicsportsradio.net. And keep in mind that social media, as well as the website, all give you the opportunity to contact me, as does traditional email, which you can do through bruce at catholicsportsradio.net. Now on to my ministry moment for this episode. The Major League Baseball season is about to start, and one of the hot topics at the start of the season for maybe three years in a row now has been rule changes. What has always amazed me is that whenever rule changes are talked about by the teams, the league, I imagine the competition committee, some of the discussion will be about what teams are doing to get around what's currently written, meaning... They have to enact something new to stop that behavior. Similarly, brand new ideas will be brought to the table. But, yep, once again, teams go to work like a scientist in a laboratory examining what the new rule is and how they can get around it. There's something inside the baseball minds, well, really any sports coaches, not just baseball, that defaults to how can we exploit this to gain a competitive edge. Sadly, it just is within them to react that way. We must challenge ourselves to do a self-audit to look to see, is that a behavior we carry out ourselves? At the ball field, in the workplace, Jesus himself was wary of tendencies so often exhibited that way, with John chapter 2, verses 24 and 25 saying, quote, But Jesus would not trust himself to them because he knew them all and did not need anyone to testify about human nature. He himself understood it well, end quote. Friends, we must challenge ourselves to discern, is the voice we're hearing that's telling us how to react to a situation truly of a godly nature, or are we convincing ourselves that our instinct, our human nature, is what is best? Moving on now with this week's episode, my guest attended the Citadel on an athletic scholarship, going on to co-captain the men's basketball team in his senior year and then receiving the Senior Class Sportsmanship Award at graduation. He had played for Marist High School in Chicago and was co-captain and MVP of his team in his senior year and was All-State Honorable Mention. He had also played for St. Charles Prep High School in Columbus, Ohio, playing both for the JV and the varsity basketball teams. He had started out playing on the St. Anthony Middle School basketball team that won the Boys Basketball of America National Championship. More recently, he was the varsity coach of the girls basketball team at Emory High School in Houston. He is also the author of a book called Sustainable Excellence, 10 Principles to Leading Your Uncommon and Extraordinary Life. Welcome to Catholic Sports Radio, Terry Tucker. Thank you, Bruce. I'm really looking forward to talking with you today. Likewise, Terry, I appreciate you making time to be on the show. 
wow, that intro sounds like a lot of moving around over the years. But let's start first with finding out where you were born and raised, as well as what the family size was. Born and raised on the south side of Chicago, I am the oldest of three boys. So there was five of us, six if you count our boxer lady. <laughs> okay, fair enough, fair enough. And you are, in fact, a cradle Catholic. Tell us about the presence of the Catholic faith as you were growing up, as well as the religious education you received along the way. Catholic faith has always been an important part of my life. I think our parents modeled what family should be about, loving each other, caring for each other, supporting each other. You know, I was an altar server growing up, loved being an altar server. I didn't get an allowance growing up. So serving funerals or weddings was always a way to get a little bit of money, <laughs> you know, to be able to buy baseball cards or something like that. So really enjoyed that. But the Catholic faith has been a huge part of my life. I'm 64 years old. It's been 64 years of trials, tribulations, ups, downs, goods, bad, but keeping God, Jesus at the center of all that that's been going on. Okay, and we can use context clues to figure out that obviously St. Anthony Middle School was a Catholic school. Let's see, St. Charles Prep High School, that sounds like it was Catholic. Was Marist High School a Catholic school? Yeah, it still is run by the Marist brothers. My middle brother has has been the principal and for the last three years now the president of that school for 25 years. Wow. Wow. The only sport that I mentioned in the intro was basketball. When did you first start playing sports? Was basketball the only sport you competed in? And for that matter, who got you started into playing sports? Yeah, it was really our dad. I'm six foot eight. And as you mentioned, hmm. went to the Citadel. I've got my youngest brother, six foot seven, pitched for Notre Dame. I've got another brother, my middle brother, who's the president and principal of Marist, is six foot six and played for the Cleveland Cavaliers. And then my dad was 6'5". Wow. So we used to joke that if you sat behind our family in church growing up, not a prayer's chance you were going to see anything <laughs> that was going on you know, in front of us. But our dad was really the one that got us playing. We started, you know, I played football, baseball, and basketball growing up. Uh. But I, I really got hooked on basketball, one, because I was 6'5", when I was 13 years old. Wow. And two... When I first started playing basketball, and this was just talk about the luck of the draw or divine intervention, if you want to say that, I started playing nine years old on a rec league. And I happened to be on the same team with a kid by the name of Scott Burkholder. Scott Burkholder's dad was the assistant basketball coach at Ohio State for Fred Taylor. Mm. And so that really opened up. I got to go to Fred Taylor's basketball camp in the summer, and that really started my love of basketball. So I, I kind of focused on basketball as I got into sports, but we all, all my brothers and I, football, baseball, and basketball was what we played. Okay, okay. Oftentimes, I will ask a guest about the time that they spent away at college. In your case, we know that you went on an athletic scholarship to the Citadel, which is actually a military college, and I'm pretty sure that Satan was unsuccessful in tempting you to fall victim to the college lifestyle because you were even involved with a faith-based organization there. I was. There was a priest there by the name of Father Sam Miglarisi, a good Italian priest. <laughs> and he was also the regimental chaplain when I was there. And so I would go to Mass every day that I possibly could. Wow. Obviously, when we were on the road, I couldn't. But so I did the Catholic thing. And then my junior year, I was elected as president of the Citadel Religious Council. It, it was an elected position started. Uh, it was a senior year job. And our job was to promote all the different faiths on campus, mm. to, to get to know the different. What, what do the Jewish people believe? What, what do the Muslim people believe? What do the Southern Baptists believe? What are all these faiths about? And how can we use that? to bring people together, not mm. separate them and move them apart. Wow. Wow. That's admirable, especially since it wasn't five years ago or 10 years ago when this type of thing has become a little bit more known. So hats off to them for having had such a program back then. Before I carry on, I have to ask, so now we're hearing about the Citadel, which is in South Carolina. I mentioned Chicago. I mentioned Columbus, Ohio. What was with all this moving around? It was really my dad's job. You know, my mom and dad and my grandparents were born and raised in Chicago. And my mom tells the story 
when my dad got a job opportunity in Atlanta, that was our first move, mm. my grandparents stopped talking to my parents. It's like, <laughs> you're not moving. Yeah, I mean, really, it, it was, I mean, we found out years later as my brother was doing genealogy that my mom's parents, my grandfather was a, a Presbyterian and my grandmother was a Catholic and they lived apart for two years after they were married because they couldn't bring themselves to tell their families that they were in an interfaith marriage, wow. even though it was a Christian marriage, they couldn't do that. And that was only a hundred years ago, Bruce, that mm. they got married. So uh, yeah, so it was my dad's job. We moved to Atlanta, then to Columbus, and then back to Chicago. And my dad was eventually the national director of real estate for McDonald's. Oh, wow. And am I correct in assuming that you must live in Houston these days, being that I mentioned that you coached a girls basketball team at Emory High School there? Uh, unfortunately, no. I live in just outside of Denver now, but wow. we lived in Houston for about 10 years. My wife and I, again, are have lived all over. We got married, moved to Santa Barbara, California. That's where our daughter was born. So we've kind of done, you know, East Coast, West Coast, and Gulf Coast. So we pretty much have the coast covered. <laughs> Terry, was the NBA or pro basketball of some kind ever a goal for you? When you were in college, where did you think that God might have been leading you? And the religious counsel aside, do you feel you were obedient to his call or at least listening for his voice? Yes and, and, and no to that. Um the NBA was something I think everybody wanted to do. You know, it was, oh my gosh, that would be the culmination of all your hard work. But I had three knee surgeries in high school and the first two were pre-arthroscopic. So I have the large zipper scar on the outside of my knee. So mm -hmm. playing in college was literally a miracle. I mean, the fact that I had the opportunity to do that after three knee surgeries was absolutely amazing. Faith was always an important part of my life. And I'll be honest with you, I struggled when I went to the Citadel. I mean, mm. I was a thousand miles away from home, had never really been away from my parents, my girlfriend, my friends and all that. And I, I literally was going to quit. I was walking over to the field house to tell the coaches, you know what, the scholarship you gave me, don't want it. I, I miss my family. I'm going home. Whoa. I really, to the, honestly, Bruce, think it was divine intervention. I thought, you know what, I'm going to go and check and see if I got any mail before I do that. And I had a seven page handwritten letter from my father. And I took it and I went into the field house and I went up into the nosebleed section and I tore the envelope open and I started to read. And my dad was, you know, I love you. You have really overcome these knee surgeries. You have a tremendous opportunity in front of you, but you need to pull your head out because you've called home seven times and not once have you asked about anybody here, your grandmothers, us, your mm. girlfriend, your friends. You are so in your head. Wow. You've got to get out of your way. You have a tremendous opportunity. And I mean, literally by the end of the letter, I was in tears. Mm. I'm like, no way I can quit. No way I can give up. I did what every good cadet did, took the handkerchief out of my back pocket, wiped my eyes, put that letter in my pocket and went back oh, and wow. four years later graduated. Mm, so powerful. That's wonderful. I had no idea, audience. <laughs> you and I are hearing this for the first time from Terry. The plot twist in all this, folks, though, is that Terry is in a 12-year cancer journey and has had his foot and then his leg amputated along the way. It makes his testimony that much more impactful that he strives to inspire. He desires to uplift people when it would be so easy to be mad at God and just choose to be miserable instead. Here is some exciting news. I am grateful for an opportunity for more people to be exposed to Catholic Sports Radio through YouTube and the YouTube Music app now carrying Catholic Sports Radio. Now, it's not video. It's still just the audio. But we all know how huge YouTube is and I do know that a big push is being made to get the YouTube Music app more a regular part of people's listening habits. This is all, by the way, spinoff from them closing the Google Podcast app. So praise God as this has been a soft launch for Catholic Sports Radio on those platforms, meaning as of the day that Terry and I are recording this, I had not put this out anywhere yet, meaning 
not in the weekly e-newsletter and not on social media yet. I have seen views starting to take place on the Catholic Sports Radio YouTube channel, what we might call unsolicited views. What I have put out there, of course, is my hope for your belief in this ministry, my hope that this show is helping you in your faith life, that you're enjoying Catholic Sports Radio and appreciate the work that I've been doing every week for more than five years now without missing once. But doing so without any sponsors and doing so without getting any income from doing this show, I have revealed that financially it does get quite challenging for me to have to find a way out of my own pocket to cover the many costs that come with operating this ministry, a lot of which I have detailed on a number of episodes of this show. But I want to be faithful to God's call for me to this and give back with my time and talent. And I have been blessed to have some guests and listeners alike make a financial gift to Catholic Sports Radio. I ask you to prayerfully consider doing the same in the spirit of Lenten almsgiving. On the show website, catholicsportsradio.net, you can utilize the blue Donate to CSR button that you'll see there. It's fast and easy to do. There's no drop-down menu of amounts to stress about. You simply decide what you're comfortable giving, type that amount into the spot that's going to start off with a dollar sign and a zero, and then hit the button to continue. And you'll see the option next, by the way, to write a note which I will see when it comes through, and then fill in the remaining fields, hit the Donate Now button, and you're done. I should mention that that will give you the option to use PayPal or a debit card or a credit card. Alternatively, you can instead contact me for information on sending a check through the mail. Get in touch via the website or social media, or email me through bruce at catholicsportsradio.net, and I will write you back with the relevant details. As you've heard me do in the past, I will happily say on the air the name of anyone who contributes, or if you wish, you can choose to remain anonymous, as some folks have directed me to do. I'm grateful for your considering supporting Catholic Sports Radio as part of your tithing as I continue working to move more people closer to Christ. Terry, as I started into all that, I mentioned about your cancer journey. Can you fill us in on all of that so that the audience can pray for you as you continue through that? Sure, Bruce. I would absolutely welcome any prayers uh, whatsoever. 2012 girls high school basketball coach in Texas, and I have a callus break open on the bottom of my left foot right below my third toe. And initially don't think much of it, but after a few weeks of it not healing, make an appointment, go to see a podiatrist friend of mine. And he takes an x-ray and says, Terry, I think you have a cyst in there and I can cut it out. And he does. And he shows it to me. It's just a little gelatin sack with some white fat in it. Mm -hmm. No dark spots, no blood, nothing that gives either one of us concern. But fortunately or unfortunately, he sends it off to pathology. And then two weeks later, I receive a call from him. And like I said, he's a friend of mine. And the more difficulty he's having explaining to me what's going on, the more frightened I am becoming. Mm. And then he just lays it out for me. He says, Terry, I've been a doctor for 25 years and I have never seen the form of cancer that you have. You have an incredibly rare form of melanoma that appears on the bottom of the feet or the palms of the hands. And at the time I was told it was a death sentence that if I received a miracle, I might be alive in five years, but more than likely I would be dead in two years. Mm. So, I was given a death sentence and thought, well, maybe through the grace of God, I can turn that death sentence into a life sentence. And that's what I've been doing for the last 12 years. Wow. Wow. And when I went into the break, I teased your cancer story by mentioning that you strive to inspire. Your desire is to uplift people. And I love that there are three values you talk about, which are character, courage, and humility, because they sound to me like you could be talking about your Catholic faith or even about sports. Absolutely. I mean, you know, we need values in life and values come from our parents. You know, that character piece of doing the right thing at the right time in the right way for the right reason. And then courage, you know, not having never saying I'm not afraid. I'm afraid a lot. But understanding that there's something here that's bigger than me. And so taking that courage and saying, all right, I'm afraid, but I'm going to move forward in that fear through the grace of God, and then humility. And humility, I just define as service above self. What can I do to make other people's lives better? And that's what I've tried to do through this cancer journey. What have I learned and how can I offer that to other people in the hope that it will help them as well? 
When you just said that service above self, how can I help others? For some reason, I might be getting hung up on the word service, but yes, as absolutely part of our Catholic faith as that sounds, could that have been born out of attending the Citadel, I wonder? I mean, we definitely talk about service and what leadership is. You know, the leader eats last. The leader supports Mm. the people in the trenches. What do you need? How can I help you? How can I make things better for you? Absolutely. That was drilled into us. That was drilled into us, my brothers and I, by our parents and things like that. So absolutely. I mean, this is an all encompassing life. It's not just one thing. And, And all the experiences that I've had, all the faith the family, the friendships that I've had, which I call my three F's, those have absolutely kind of melded together to get me to a point where I'm just trying to offer things to people that might make their lives a little bit better. Okay, so let's back up then. I kind of went a little off tangent there, but talking about the cancer journey, help me through, Terry, what was the timing of the foot and the leg amputation as it relates to your having coached the girls' high school basketball team at Emory High School in Houston from 2009 to 2013, because I'm wondering if it actually enabled you to impart any life lessons on those student-athletes that others obviously would not have the same experience to draw from. Although I do wonder, too, though, if you're having had knee surgeries while you were in high school, was a teaching moment that you were able to use for those girls also? Oh, absolutely. Uh, Unfortunately, 2012, was almost my last year, 2012, 2013 season was my last year. It's the last year that I've been able to work. As I mentioned, my diagnosis was a death sentence. And Mm -hmm. so my doctor put me on this weekly injection of a drug called interferon that basically gave me severe flu-like symptoms for two to three days. It was just ugly. And I took those weekly injections for almost five years. Hmm. So imagine having the flu every week for five years. And that wasn't a cure. That was as my doctor used to say, we're trying to kick the can down the road. And I'll be honest with you, Bruce, there were several times where I prayed to die. You know, I kind of felt there was living and then there was not dying. And I was sort of in that not dying camp. If you would ask me what my goals were, I would have said, I'm just going to try to survive today. And if I wake up tomorrow morning, well, I'm going to try to do it again. And I begged God to to let me die. I begged, like, look, take me out of this. But he didn't. And what he did was gave me the strength, the courage, the fortitude to go on. And if you fast forward, when I had my leg amputated and I'm still being treated for tumors in my lungs, my doctor showed me my CAT scan. And I have no medical background. I don't know how to read a CAT scan, but you can kind of look at it and be like, well, that sure doesn't look like it belongs there. And I have these, <laughs> these big tumors in my lungs and fluid all around the pleural spaces on the outside of my lungs. And I remember looking at my doctor and saying, how was I alive? And Bruce, I, I'll never forget this until the day I die. He put his head down, he shook his head no, and then he looked up at me and he said, I don't know because you shouldn't have been, Mm. which said to me that God's not done with me yet. When I die, where I die, how I die, way above my pay grade, spend more time concentrating on the living portion of it, not so much the worrying about the dying part of it. Amen. Amen. I always say that for myself, having gone through two open heart surgeries, two strokes, a motorcycle accident. I was hospitalized with COVID for a week. I always say the Lord obviously has special plans for me that he's letting me get through all of that. So we just keep living the mystery, as my spiritual director is known for saying. Terry, tell us about your book, which is called Sustainable Excellence, 10 Principles to Leading Your Uncommon and Extraordinary Life. And be gentle with me here. I'm going to guess, could it be said that it's a business book written with a Christian heart? Absolutely. Uh, That's exactly what it is. And, you know, I I never wanted to write a book. I was really taking, you know, people are like, you should write a book. And, you know, there's sort of that old joke that says when when we talk to God, it's called prayer. When God talks to us, it's called schizophrenia. And God never told me to write a book. But I think what God does is he puts people in your life that start making the suggestion. You should do this. You should write a book. You should Mm. write a book. You should write a book. And it's your, you know, we have free will. We have free choice. We can say, you know what, God, no, I don't want to write a book. I want to go over here and do what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And God's like, okay, fine. That's your choice to do. But when enough people started suggesting I should write a book, I thought, well, maybe I should sort of perk up and listen to them. 
And that's really, I always say I wrote sustainable excellence, but it was inspired by something that's much bigger than me. Mm -hmm. So who should read that book? I mean, you say anybody, but that's just too broad of an audience. <laughs> I really do think it's for younger people that are sort of getting into life. And, you know, Bruce, I've seen so many people that think they're born empty and that when they get into life, whatever that looks like for them, that then their job is to fill themselves up. You know, they got to get the great job, make a lot of money and drive the nice car, live in the nicest house and have the latest gear. And that somehow that's going to make them happy and fulfilled. And what I found is it's just the opposite. We're not born empty. We're born full. We're born with everything we need to be successful in life already inside of us. We just need to pull it out and use it to our benefit. So our purpose in life should not be to fill ourselves up. Our purpose in life should be to empty ourselves out, certainly for the betterment of ourselves, but also for the betterment of our family, of our friends, of our community, of our country. Nicely said. And audience, I'm going to be putting a link to Terry's website on the show page for this episode on catholicsportsradio.net so you can link over to learn more about him and his book. This has come up once or twice before in the show, but I'm not going to pretend that everyone listening to this interview has heard all 265 before this one. So, Terry, tell the audience what the Rosary Confraternity is, of which you are a current member. It's just an organization that is committed to our Blessed Mother and committed to saying a rosary a day. And and I fail miserably at that, especially when I'm in treatment for my cancer. But during the weeks when I'm not in treatment, I say a rosary every day and I spend at least an hour in prayer. I've met so many people along this journey that are struggling and you know, reached out to me and said, hey, you know, I, I need help. And I can't do much for them other than offer my ear to listen and my prayers. And so I spent an hour at least every day. I say that rosary. I say the divine mercies. I say prayers that hopefully will help the people that have reached out to me and certainly hopefully help myself. I'm, I'm a little bit mercenary in that, that I want some help as well. I need that help. I cannot do this by myself. And so just to be clear, if someone is going to pray a rosary for you, if they're going to pray a novena, if they're going to lift you up at adoration, because people would say, well, obviously we should pray for his cancer to be cured, but just help in that regard, Terry, in terms of what would be most helpful that we should be prayerful about when we're lifting you up as part of our prayers? Yeah, I've never prayed to be cured. You know, people have asked me, you know, do you wonder why you got this? I mean, you must blame God. Like, no, I don't blame God. Why not me? What makes me so special that I mm. shouldn't get cancer, that that I shouldn't learn from this? And, wow. and Bruce, I've learned so much through these things. And I think two of the things that I've learned is, number one, I really don't think you know yourself until you've been tested by some form of adversity in life. And secondly, I think, and this is going to sound so weird, cancer's made me a better human being. You know, when you can't do the things you were good at, you focus on and do the things that are important in life. So when people pray for me, just pray that I get through my treatments. My treatments wreck my body mm. and they wreck my body and they wreck my mind. I have such a hard time focusing. You know, I mean, I, I cry. I get down. I feel sorry for myself. Pray for me that I get through those times. Those okay. are the most difficult for okay. me. Okay, okay, that helps, that helps. And obviously, folks, we want to be praying for Terry and his family, too. And I know you have a daughter that played basketball at the U.S. Air Force Academy, but let's close, Terry, by having you share all about your immediate family, including how long you and your wife have been in the sacrament of holy matrimony. My wife and I have been married for 30 years. It'll be 31 mm. years in October. Uh, I would not be here without my wife. She has absolutely seen things in my health journey that has gotten me f to move forward. I mean, I think about our 30-year marriage, and 12 of those years have been just battling cancer. I mean, I've so many times felt guilty of, you should just put me in a nursing home and get on with your life. But she takes that faith. And she was not a cradle Catholic. She was not Catholic when we married mm. and developed the interest. And then 
went into the RCIA program when we lived in Santa Barbara and became Catholic. So it's just the two of us and then our daughter. My, <laughs> our daughter got, unfortunately, my height and is <laughs> six foot two wow. and had an NBA three-point shooting range. So she was, was recruited to play basketball in college, chose the Air Force Academy, and is now a captain in the new branch of the military, the Space Force, is married to a classmate who is a pilot in the Air Force. Very proud of both of them. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Fantastic, fantastic. Terry, wonderful testimony. Thank you so much for making time to be on Catholic Sports Radio. God bless you and your family. Thank you, Bruce. Thanks for having me on. God bless you as well. My pleasure. And audience, I thought it would be fitting as a nod to all the years that Terry did spend playing basketball if we close this week's episode with a player prayer. So let's do that together, of course, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God, let me play well, but fairly. Let competition make me strong, but never hostile. Forbid me to rejoice in the adversity of others. See me not when I am cheered, but when I bend to help my opponent up. If I know victory, allow me to be happy. If I am denied, keep me from envy. Remind me that sports are just games. Help me to learn something that matters once the game is over. And if through athletics I set an example, let it be a good one. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks so much for listening. This is Catholic Sports Radio. Find more at catholicsportsradio.net, as well as on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. It is at Cat Sports Radio on all those. C-A-T-H, at Cat Sports Radio. I'm Bruce Wozniak, and remember, it's not whether you win or lose, it's that it's Jesus that you always choose. Thank you.